Welcome to the 15th meeting of the Health and Sports Committee of 2018. Can I ask everyone in the room please to ensure that mobiles are off or switched to silent and that uh, uh, mobile devices are, which may be used for social media are not used for recording or photographing proceedings. The first item on our agenda is an evidence session with representatives of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, as part of our programme of taking evidence uh, from NHS boards. Uh, may I welcome to the committee John Brown, CBE, the Chairman, uh, Jane Grant, Chief Executive, uh, Mark White, Director of Finance, Dr Jennifer Armstrong, uh, uh, the Medical Director, uh, Jonathan Best, Interim Chief Officer for Acute Services, and David Williams, Chief Officer of Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership. Welcome to you all, and can I invite uh, John Brown to make an opening statement? Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to share the work of Greater. Uh, Glasgow and Clyde, uh, as a convener, uh, has already done the introductions uh, for my colleagues. Uh, I, I just would like to pause just before I start uh, and put on record uh, how privileged I feel to actually have such a strong senior leadership team. Uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, is the largest uh, of the Scottish Health Board. In fact, it's the largest healthcare organisation in the UK. Uh, and to have such a strong uh, leadership team makes all the difference to the role of the chair and the role of the board. Uh, obviously, uh, being such a big organisation, when uh, we submit documents uh, to any committee to explain uh, our business, there's a, a considerable uh, amount of information to try and get across. But uh, hopefully, uh, these documents will give, and you'll give you some insight uh, into how uh, the board has responded to the challenges that are faced by all the healthcare providers across uh, the UK. Uh, the documents you've got mainly describe the current situation, uh, but uh, as this committee is very well aware, the change in demographics, uh, the ageing population, uh, combined with a lot of other factors, including, for example, the shortage of some specialist skills uh, in the clinical world, uh, means that uh, all health boards have to actually change if we're going to continue to deliver the high quality uh, services that we aspire to. Uh, I hope you don't mind me using some notes. Uh, I'm going to try and keep this fairly short. Uh, I was interested when I, I looked at some of the other presentations that other boards have made to the committee, just how short some of my colleagues have managed to make it. Uh, unfortunately, because of the size uh, and the complexity of Greater Glasgow and Clyde, might Mine might just be a bit longer than you normally have, but I've got some notes to try and keep me on track. Uh, so, uh, uh, b before really moving forward and looking at uh, our plans to transform health and social care uh, to meet uh, the increase in demands that are on the system, uh, probably just a, a couple of minutes, if you don't mind, to describe uh, just who we are and what we do and put it into that, that context. Population we serves at 1.1 million people. It's across six local authorities, which is one of the reasons why, of course, there was uh, so much briefing paper coming forward. Uh, we employ around 39,000 people. We are the biggest employer in Scotland, uh, uh, and we're located across 10 hospitals, 61 health centres. We have around 115 care homes currently, 237 GP practices. And of course, uh, given where we are positioned geographically, 87 of them are in the top 100 most deprived areas. Uh, so we've got 87 deep end practices, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with that concept. Uh, big organisation, very big budget, uh, over £3 billion pounds annually of the taxpayers' money that we're responsible for. Um, and as I said, that makes us the largest healthcare organisation in the UK, uh, and we represent uh, almost 25% uh, of NHS Scotland. Uh, a large demand on the system, a, a large number of uh, patients, service users, their families and their carers uh, looking to us to support them. Uh, we have almost half a million visits a year uh, to our a &E departments, uh, which is high uh, and disproportionately high if you think about the size of the population. We have over 200,000 scheduled inpatient appointments and 1.1 million outpatient appointments in a year. Five million people in Greater Glasgow and Clyde go to their GPs every year, uh, and we deliver over 15,000 babies. 24 million prescriptions uh, uh, go out in our part of Scotland. 
Uh, the Greater Glasgow and Clyde isn't just about uh, the geographical patch covered by six local authorities. We also provide specialist services for either all of Scotland or for the population in the west of Scotland. So we have things like the National Spinal Injuries Unit, uh, the Paediatric Intensive Care uh, are all on a national basis. Uh, uh, we also have the Beats in West of Scotland yeah, Cancer Centre. Significant training board, uh, so we do more than uh, simply deliver the services. Uh, we actually continue to grow the capability and capacity for NHS Scotland. We have around 1,300 uh, doctors at any point in time actually in training uh, across the board. Uh, and we support 800 medical students. Uh, there's a lot of uh, good work done with Greater Glasgow and Clyde in the universities. Uh, we do a lot of clinical research. We work very closely with Glasgow University, Strathclyde University. We also work with the private sector, uh, and we deliver over 900 clinical research studies uh, in a year. So we're at the forefront of R&D. We are... At the forefront, I would like to think of the work to deliver the health and social care delivery plan. Uh, our priorities are four key aims, uh, are better health, better care, better value, and a better workforce. Uh, you will have seen the triple aims, and I think a, a number of organisations, papers would describe them as better care, better value, and better health. We've put better health first on our list because of the priority we think that needs to be given uh, to prevention, to improving the population's uh, overall health uh, for the future. Uh, and we've added better workforce uh, because we clearly recognise that making Greater Glasgow and Clyde a, a good place to work, in fact, a great place to work, uh, will help us recruit and train the best quality staff. So that's kind of who we are and what we do. Uh, but the real question is uh, what needs to change? Uh, what are we going to do different? differently. So we want to move from treatment to prevention. Uh, so a real uh, emphasis within Glasgow and Clyde uh, around public health. Uh, clearly, uh, we want to maintain and where possible improve safety and our performance and the quality of care. Uh, and one of our big challenges that faces uh, all health boards in trying to move to a new system of health, integrated health and social care is how do we move resources out of acute care to primary and community care. Of course, like everyone else in the public sector, it helps no different. Uh, we have to live within our budget allocations. Well, uh, I mean, I'm pleased to say that this year, once again, uh, we delivered a balanced budget, which given the size of the budget and the complexity of the system is at no mean feat. And I credit to uh, my colleagues in the senior leadership team uh, and our expectation is we'll do likewise this year. Uh, but living within your means is never easy in the public sector. I've been uh, 45 years in the public sector, uh, and that has, challenge has always been there, uh, and every year I think it gets harder. Uh, we need to stay, for us to stay in financial balance, I think it's realistic for the taxpayer to expect us firstly to be uh, as efficient as we can with the resources we've got. Uh, so we have done a lot to reduce our costs, reduce waste, and improve productivity uh, in the current system, but that's an ongoing process. Uh, in the current year, uh, we're looking to save uh, around 40 to 50 million pounds out of being more efficient. Uh, we think uh, that's doable. We've got a good track record in that regard. Uh, last year, our efficiencies overall uh, were just over 60 million, 40 million of that c coming out of the acute services. Uh, but in addition to being uh, more efficient in the current services, we're also looking for how we can do things differently, how we can deliver the new system. So we've invested a lot of time and energy and thinking into our transformation programme, which we call uh, Moving Forward Together. It's called that to emphasise the inclusive nature of it. Uh, it's been designed uh, by our clinicians. Uh, our involvement of our staff is very important to us to get the design right, but the involvement of our patients, our service users, is equally as important, uh, as is the involvement of their, represent their representatives uh, which is why today I think it's a good opportunity for us to talk a wee bit about what we're doing looking forward. Uh, this approach, as you would expect, is based on uh, an analysis of the population's existing and future needs. Uh, so it is uh, very much research-driven. Uh, it brings into the also play the latest thinking around best practice in health service delivery. 
uh, not just in Scotland, but also across the UK and wider. Uh, and it conforms and supports the direction set by the Health and Social Care Delivery Plan. Uh, Dr Jennifer Armstrong here, uh, our medical director, uh, quite rightly, uh, is the person that we've asked uh, to lead on this redesign of the service, and she's been working with her colleagues uh, across uh, the different specialities and across the different clinical uh, groupings uh, to look at what's the best way to deliver in the future, uh, and I'm sure Jennifer will be happy to talk more about that. Uh, we're not just looking at what we do from this Greater Glasgow and Clyde perspective, of course, in Lyme Health and Social Care Delivery Plan, we're also looking at what we can do to support uh, national changes and what we can do to support regional changes. Uh, of course, uh, being uh, the biggest resource uh, within NHS Scotland, we've got a big part to play in it. Uh, and all of my senior team here uh, have been involved in national uh, and regional planning uh, work. Uh, a good example of how we're taking that forward, of course, nationally is looking at uh, developing a major trauma centre for the West. Uh, we're looking at adopting a, a more regional approach to cancer services and introducing our West of Scotland renal transplant service. Uh, while we're working with our colleagues uh, to develop this uh, population-based approach, was the best way to describe it, uh, to deliver our services, of course, there's pros and cons of this. Uh, it does mean that some set services will be centralised into centres of excellence, which will make them physically less accessible in the sense that perhaps less local, but a better quality service, looking to provide better outcomes. Uh, but that, that's an issue for us in how we engage with the public and we get the public on board with what the benefits of making these changes are at the earliest possible st stage, how we engage with the public at the earliest possible stage and the design of the services uh, so they can meet their needs uh, as well as make the service delivery that more efficient and effective. It's getting that balance right is what we have to do. Of course, when we do look forward, uh, we can't take our eye off the ball of the here and now. Uh, we have to recognise that uh, we need to do more uh, in our current services and there's a lot of energy again goes into trying to improve current performance we need to do more, as the papers I've shown you, in relation to elective work. Yeah, uh, uh, an example of a, uh, one of our areas of performance that uh, we're doing a lot to try and get up is uh, the number of patients who are waiting longer than we would like before starting their cancer treatment. So the 62-day target, you'll be familiar with that terminology. It's one of the areas we're putting a lot of effort into. And of course, unscheduled care. Uh, we have done a lot of work over the last year to improve our unscheduled care. Uh, uh, we have stabilised our, perfor our performance at the front of the hospitals, uh, but it still needs to improve. Uh, uh, again, our Chief Executive, Chief Operating Officer, more than happy to talk about any particular issue uh, around our current performance. Um, uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, David Williams with us. Uh, David's one of the six Chief Officers uh, for the Health and Social Care Partnerships. Uh, David has the largest one. He's the Chief Officer uh, in, in Glasgow City. Uh, and David will be happy to talk through any issues uh, around health and social care partnerships, the setting up of the IGBs and so on. And he will cover all six, not just the Glasgow one. Sure. Oh. Of course, having six local authorities, having six health and social care partners, six integration joint, uh, joint boards brings challenges, uh, as well as opportunities for us. Uh, so we've put a lot of energy uh, since the HSCPs, the IJBs come into being uh, to work and to ensure that uh, the work of the HSCPs and the IJBs, the Health Board, the Council, that they're all consistent, they're all heading in the same direction, that they're integrated and uh, for the integration joint boards in particular that they're supporting the delivery of the health and social care uh, delivery plan and the aims and objectives. Uh, uh, this integrated approach that we have uh, obviously presents a governance challenge. Uh, it's an integrated organisation with more governance boards than we had before. So we have reviewed and revised our approach to governance and uh, bring together the full system at the subcommittee level within the boards. And again, I can talk uh, more about that should you wish to uh, find a bit more of the detail. OK. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you very much. I, I think there's, you've, you've laid out quite a number of the challenges that we're going to want to explore with you this morning. 
uh, and uh, let's 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 do that. You, you talked about the need for change, and uh, one of the uh, mechanisms for achieving change clearly is the annual accountability review, and those uh, set out in the short term over 12 month periods what it is you need to do in order to improve performance. I would perhaps start with some questions on those. Can I ask Alec Cole Hamilton to ask a couple of questions about those? Well, in particular, I'd like to uh, take our focus to waiting times and uh, particularly the 12 week guarantee, which has been exceeded um, for both inpatient appointments and outpatient appointments for uh, the number of people waiting more than that 12 week has doubled in the last year in both cases. Now, this committee understands that one of the principal um, reasons for um, that kind of delay or waiting time delay in any health board is, is about demand vastly outstripping supply. We accept that. But one of the biggest interruptions in supply is delayed discharge. Yet you are the best performing health board in the country in terms of reducing bed blocking and delayed discharge. That doesn't seem to scan for me. Can you explain to me what is causing that delay in treatment for all those people if it's not delayed discharge? I, I think you're right in identifying uh, the, the challenges, how we match uh, our resources with the demand uh, and the different uh, demands there are on the resources across the piece. I, I'm going to invite Jane Grant uh, to actually talk a bit more in detail about the work that she and her team have been doing to try and baseline uh, what our capacity is and how we can actually improve and increase that capacity to better meet the demand, how we can target our resources to the particularly high priority areas that are within the TD treatment time guarantee space. Jen. Okay, thank you. I'll give you some oversight and then maybe Jonathan, who's, who's dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis, could, could give you some insight. So I, th I think one of the challenges, as the Chairman has said, is we need to balance the elective work with the unscheduled care demand as well. And that's been a challenge for us, as you can see from the figures. We have spent um, some time this year looking at the capacity, our base baseline capacity, in terms of looking at the number of clinics we've got, what the clinic templates are, what the actual demand profile is, and they're different for each specialty. And in some areas, that, the, that, that there has been a significant gap because we have, on a, on a non-recurring basis, been been, been covering that gap on, on a, for a number of years. So the, the, the challenge is to get to a recurring um, balance for that. And it has taken us a little while to get to the absolute detail of how many theatre sessions there are, how many clinics there are, when they start, when they finish, and what that looks like. Um, we, we're now well down that road, and we've made significant progress in, in establishing that baseline uh, capacity we do have. Um, you refer to delayed discharges, but it's not all about beds. I mean, there are some areas clearly where it is about beds, um, and, and we have work to do there. But the delayed discharge work, and, and David and others might pick up on that, but we have done a lot of work with the six partnerships and with the board to deal with that. And as you see, our performance in that is good. However, the, the capacity gap in inpatients and day cases is, is much more than just the beds. It's about the, the resource we've got, the theatre sessions we've got, the, the, the manpower we've got, um, and the workforce we've got. So, so we've got to look at um, what workforce we do have and what physical capacity we do have as well. And our focus has been on making sure that we have an efficient service and that we are actually being able to, to prove that the productivity and the efficiency within the, the baseline we have got um, is correct. So we're looking at that. We're also looking at redesigning some pathways and doing things in a different way, as well as the traditional additionality. And we believe that that tripartite approach will get us into a much better position during this year. Uh, I don't know, Jonathan, if there's anything you want to add to that. Thanks, Jane. Yes. Um, maybe just a couple of things to add to that. I think you're absolutely right. What, we, what we've done is we, we've stepped back and looked at a written branch review of the capacity that we've got just now and how we can fit that capacity to the, the demand that's being referred into our hospitals. So we've taken each specialty. We've taken um, how many clinics we have over a year. We've done it consultant by consultant. Um, and we've looked at our ability to maximise the use of the clinic slots, clinic sessions. Um, and we're also looking at ways to redesign. I think one of the um, exciting opportunities is the Modern Outpatients programme, which you'll be familiar with. Um, and we've got a number of streams of, of work going on within that. I think um, one of them to mention is patient-focused booking, which actually is giving the majority of patients a choice of when they come to hospital and what time. And I think that opt-in process through our referral management centres is certainly proven popular and it avoids wastage of appointments and allows us to maximise what we provide to the patients. Um, thank you, convener. Um, in terms of 
um, how you manage those um, patients waiting longer than 12 weeks. Uh, the, the, the health boards that seem to do best around this are the ones that capture at a granular level the reasons why people are waiting longer than the 12-week guarantee. They set them up in a register and then they talk about what they're going to do to mitigate those problems or interruptions in the future. D it, do you do anything like that? So, so we do look at the waiting lists on a regular basis. We look at um, the urgent and urgent slots and make sure that patients who require urgent care are, are dealt with first. We'll make sure that we are looking again at the cancer slots to make sure we've got enough um, capacity to do that. And then we look, and our, our board's access policy talks about um, clinical priority and then in a date order. And one of the challenges we've got across Glasgow and Clyde is that we are a very big organisation and therefore um, we have got a number of um, places where people can attend for an orthopaedic appointment or so on, and sometimes that demand and capacity in the sector doesn't actually uh, balance. However, we've got to be cognizant of the fact that actually um, people in Clyde perhaps don't want to travel to, to the Royal Infirmary, so we've got a bit of work to do as well about trying to smooth that pathway and make sure that patients have got some choice, but also that they have got access quickly to, to services within their local area when they need to, to do that. So that's some of the work we're doing just now I don't know, Jonathan, if you want to add anything else. The other, that example I was going to give is actually for a, a more wider example. Um, as you know, and the Chairman's mentioned, we provide services for um, the region, but also some national services. And we also support, for example, the Western Isles. And we've got a recent uh, pilot project started um, through telehealth and video conferencing. So um, I was over at the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow, and one of their uh, orthopaedic surgeons is now holding his whole day clinic via a video link to the Western Isles. So in the Western Isles, there'll be a, a physiotherapist or a specialist with each of the patients. So it's a whole day clinic, and therefore all of the clinics do not, all of the patients, sorry, do not need to travel down to Glasgow. Um, and from that particular list of about 20 to 30 patients, I think seven were listed for surgery, which is, uh, I think, a very good and efficient way of running the service. And we need to do a lot more of that. So that we're all not only managing the lists, but we're managing how people come to see us and, and how we, uh, uh, anticipate their needs. Final follow-up question briefly, if I may convene it. Um, I think the other thing I'd be keen to hear about is expectation management, because as a MSP for Edinburgh Western, I get um, a steady stream of uh, constituents through my door with letters from the health board, which say, yes, you've been scheduled for surgery or treatment of some one kind or another. You can expect by law to be seen within 12 weeks, but sometimes exceptional pressures mean that that slips. And only to find that they get another letter a few weeks later saying, actually, it's not 12 weeks, it's nine months, you're going to have to wait. And, and I think there's something terribly cruel about that expectation management, and I've taken this up with NHS Lothian before. Um, how do you manage expectation in terms of when you know you're likely to miss the 12-week tre the treatment guarantee? You're absolutely right, and um, the patient management system we have generates these letters automatically and makes sure that the, the correct um, date is, is given to the patients. Um, in Glasgow, over the past year, we've changed our, uh, our correspondence with patients um, to be much more um, uh, upfront and open about when the dates will be. But also, I think what's very important is we, we provide advice lanes and we provide phone numbers that they can actually speak to someone. So they can speak to um, not just a not just a receptionist, but they can speak to um, one of the nursing staff, specialist nursing staff, or indeed a, a doctor if they need to discuss their condition. That's beginning to bear a bit of fruit, but it doesn't detract from the fact that it is a longer wait for some patients. Okay. Thank you, Convener. The, the Cabinet Secretary set you some specific targets for this current year. She said that the waiting time standards for outpatients and inpatients should be no worse than they were last year. And this, she said that the four-hour accident and emergency wait at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital should be achieved in at least 92% of the uh, cases. You missed all of those targets. The patterns have gone the opposite direction. Was she unreasonable in setting those requirements? I think, as we've explained, the elective position has been difficult. There's no doubt about that. Where um, the whole of Scotland, I think, has found it difficult, and we have spent, as I say, some time trying to to get the baseline capacity to to build that. Because if we just keep on um, doing more and more additionality, then actually we will never crack. So we've spent some time this year trying to actually establish what capacity we do have. So we recognise there's a lot to do. We recognise there are a number of initiatives which we've talked about already um, to try and deal with that. And we do. We have looked at the operational plan for this year, and and uh, signed up to to returning to the March 17 position, with the exception of outpatients, which we're trying to, going to try and do over two years because it is very significant. 
Um, in addition to that, we, we, are, we have to balance that with the ED targets, and we are making sustained progress with that, albeit that uh, the increasing demand coming through the emergency flow is proving to be somewhat challenging for us, and we've got work to do in light with through our unscheduled steering group across the board, which includes partnerships to try and change and alter those um, demand profiles. So the complexity of that picture across the size of Greater Glasgow and Clyde is, is not to be underestimated, but we do have work to do and we recognise that. So do accountability reviews drive performance at all for the board? Yes, they do. They do. And I think the, the feedback that we've had, um, it would be, uh, it's, it's at one level helpful to see that the things that came back from the accountability review are the things that we are paying attention to and that we recognise our challenges for the board. So we were working on them anyway, but it is, it is very much about being accountable in the public domain for those areas where we do need to do better, and we absolutely recognise that, and we're working really hard to do that. So, so what happens, if we take this year as an example, what happens when your set targets as part of that accountability review for the following 12 months and you then don't meet those targets? What's the consequence of that? So, so what we've done this year uh, going forward is to set more detailed trajectories so we can clearly see where we should be at, at, you know, on a monthly and quarterly basis. And we spent more of our time last year trying to establish the base capacity and some of the base issues. This year, we're quite clear about the trajectories we have to do so as we can see whether we're ahead or behind and whether the actions um, are absolutely delivering what it is we set out to do. Um, and in some areas, that's easier, easier to be said than done um, because sometimes the cause and effect is not exactly a direct impact. But we've set out clearly the actions and the trajectories in a more detailed way and that will give us and the board um, the ability to be able to see very early in the year if things are going awry um, much more swiftly this year. And, and, and finally on this, does the direct involvement of ministers in the accountability review make a difference to the outputs on, and, and indeed to the uh, responses from the board? Yes, yeah, certainly we work closely with Scottish Government all the time um, and certainly having the minister there does focus the mind on, on the key priorities. Um, I've also been um, involved in non-ministerial reviews as well in, in other boards and, and actually the focus there is, is, is quite important as well on the same key issues but certainly having the Minister um, in the room certainly focuses the mind of, of the team and everyone. Okay, thank you very much. We've, we've touched on delayed discharge but I know Ash Denham will want to follow up after. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Very quickly, Sandra. Yeah. But, uh, uh, good morning. Um, I did ask about a supplementary about 10 minutes ago. Um, I wanted to pick up on what Alex Cole Hamilton was saying in regards to obviously people come along and uh, they can't get their operation, the time differences and cancelled, etc. And obviously you're looking at new policies in that respect. Do you uh, ad advise these people that they can actually go on another hospital waiting list? Do you advise that to folk? Is that part of the information you give? Certainly, I know I do. I will phone up other other, other uh, areas to see if there's a vacancy for a patient to go there. Do you advise on that? We do advise them of that, and we also have, uh, at the consultation, a conversation with patients because, in many instances, patients may want to stay in their locality. Some mm -hmm. choose to wait, some don't. So, for example, um, uh, many folks in Greenock would prefer to go to the local hospital. However, we do offer uh, across a range of hospitals in Greater Glasgow and Clyde because we do have, for example, orthopaedic departments in most hospitals. But again, the key issue is that the clinical priorities are seen first and then, as, as Jane has alluded to, that we see people in day order. But we do have that con uh, conversation with patients. Okay. Uh, just one slight... <laughs> one other one. Um, I noticed the peaks and the troughs and, and, and the outpatients and obviously waiting lists as well. Uh, can you tell us that when there's a flu epidemic, because that's one of the peaks uh, in the, the report that we have here, uh, obviously affects your targets. How does that apply to your targets? If it's a flu epidemic, obviously the beds are full, admissions can't come in. Does this, is it taken into account that there's such a thing as a flu epidemic or that type of thing? So, <clears throat> clearly this year we've had one or two um, short times where we've had really substantial mm -hmm. additional demand and, and we have had to cancel some patients during those periods to ensure that we had enough capacity to deal both in terms of beds but also in terms of workforce to make sure we're dealing with those patients appropriately. However, they have been short-lived and they have been small and we are working hard to, to mitigate that and make sure that we're getting back those patients who were inconvenienced during that period um, have been reappointed as soon as possible. So we're working hard to do that. But undoubtedly, there have been one or two challenges this winter um, for short periods. 
Thank you. Good morning to the panel. I just wanted to ask you about um, the delayed discharges, and clearly you've had some made some really good progress on that. Um, but other boards, I think, are struggling um, with this issue themselves. So I was wondering if you could perhaps share with the committee uh, particular actions that you've taken that have allowed you know, success in reducing delayed discharge, um, particularly where it might be of, of use perhaps to another board that might be struggling with this issue. I'll just say some brief words and then maybe David could pick up. So we, we have tried to address this in Glasgow and Clyde as a whole system issue between the acute and, and uh, partnerships because we do believe it is a whole system issue. It's not one part of the domain. Um, and if we don't have efficient processes for identification of patients early when they're in hospital, um, then that will lead to delays. In addition, if we don't have a good dialogue with our, par our partnership colleagues, then they won't be anticipating what, what, what the patient profile they have got to, to deal with. Um, David and colleagues, we have we have, I work closely with um, the, the, the corporate directors as well within the board. Um, to make sure there is some coherence across the, the, the whole of the health board area. But David will pick up on one or two of the examples that he, he's been involved in. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, the, the, whilst the performance is good in Glasgow, we're never complacent, uh, and it requires uh, a, an incredible uh, amount of hard work uh, to keep on top of uh, the uh, performance and, and the demand. Uh, that is uh, uh, within the system on a, a continuous basis. Uh, and uh, so there is, as uh, Jane has highlighted, uh, real joined up working between the acute system uh, and uh, partnership uh, workers uh, and managers. Uh, and also that engages and involves uh, provider organisations uh, who will, uh, from the independent sector particularly, who will be providing care placements in care homes and also uh, uh, care at home provision, uh, and to ensure that there is a, a kind of smoothness uh, in the system. But that granular uh, detail of knowing patients is, is key to that in relation to uh, looking at how can we uh, keep on top of uh, the, the, the progress through hospital of patients, uh, and that's that, that, as I say, requires hard work, uh, and people are committed to uh, achieving the best performance that we possibly can do. Uh, we have, uh, within uh, the six partnerships within uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, uh, in invested in a number of uh, uh, provisions that are uh, assisting all of that. So um, in Glasgow City, uh, for instance, and, and one or two of the other partnerships, Intermediate Care, uh, beds uh, specifically designed to look at a reabling uh, process and approach uh, to look at how can we assist and support patients to go home uh, rather than to necessarily, particularly for the over age, the 65 age group and, and the older populations within that, uh, assuming or coming to the conclusion that actually I've I'm just heading to a residential care bed or a nursing care bed, and that's because most people tell us that they want to be at home. So we, in order to deliver on that, we have changed our thinking uh, around about how we uh, have moved away from assessing people in a hospital bed for their long-term care needs, and I think that's really important uh, that we have the early referrals so that we can get social work uh, f uh, staff in to, to uh, uh, meet with families and individuals and begin to assess uh, at a low level whether that person can go home with or without home care support or whether they can uh, go and need to go into intermediate care because the assessment process is a bit more convoluted uh, and complex and their needs are a bit more complex. So uh, that process, and we set targets for delivery and, and achievement we, uh, in, in terms of provision of intermediate care, we, we, we've set targets of, for instance, trying to see if we can complete the reablement re and the rehabilitation within uh, the intermediate care beds to a, a kind of minimum of, of uh, 30 days or thereabouts. Uh, and uh, if we can uh, strive to get uh, approximately 30% of people who go into intermediate care beds home, uh, recognising that these individuals have got complex needs. Uh, and so we've uh, got a performance uh, uh, regime in place to, to deliver on that. And I think that's been really important. So in summary, uh, uh, hard work, joined up working uh, between acute and uh, partnerships and also the independent and uh, voluntary sector if they're involved in that because, as I say, they, they are part of that process. Uh, so genuine partnership working, which I think is the essence of 
the integration uh, agen agenda, if you like, around about how we uh, uh, transform uh, health and social care delivery, uh, and uh, where we're able to invest in, in new uh, models of, of provision, uh, then we should be able to do that. And, uh, and, and, and that does require some challenge in the system, uh, which is more difficult for some of the other areas uh, across Scotland. <coughs> Um, smaller partnerships, for instance, if they wish to invest in intermediate care beds, may only require three or four beds to make a m big difference. But registering those three or four beds within a care home that's a long-term permanent home for the, re the other uh, residents within that care home can be a challenge. So the, the response has to be variable. Uh, I think the key to how the system impacts positively for a big complex health board like Greater Glasgow and Clyde is that the six chief officers uh, work in tandem and we strive to achieve consistency uh, across the piece so that it doesn't conflict and, and impact negatively in the system. Okay, thank you. Alison Johnson. Um, yes, thanks. Um, obviously, representing Lothian, it's not without its challenges when it comes to delayed discharge. And I just wonder if, um, you know, do you have... Is it easier to get hold of, of property because it's more affordable to deliver, uh, you know, the, the care home setting? Um, why are you finding it easier to get staff? You know, I just wonder how well this best practice, because you clearly are having greater success than many health boards, as Ash Denham pointed out. You know, is this practice being shared or is it simply that one size will never fit all and what you're doing um, in your neck of the woods can't be replicated in others? Or do you think there are some lessons that can be learned? Yeah. Um, I absolutely think there are lessons that can be learned, but uh, in saying that, I absolutely don't believe that there's a one-size-fits-all for all partnerships across Scotland. And as I've said, intermediate care provision, for instance, uh, won't be applicable in some areas because of scale, because uh, there are other more appropriate responses. I think the, the in, in, in Glasgow City in particular, uh, and more broadly in the six partnerships across uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, uh, there's a bigger population from which, with which to draw from in terms of recruitment, so there are less challenges there. Uh, I think there are issues around about the availability of, of care home provision. Uh, so if we went back uh, not that far, and, and it's still the case in, in, in Glasgow City in particular, we had an over-provision uh, of, of care home uh, facilities, and, and that, that probably reflected to a certain extent the, the land values uh, in the west of the country, and particularly uh, the city where property could be developed and built relatively more affordably than, uh, than perhaps some parts of uh, uh, other parts of the country. Uh, and, uh, and I think there was um, a real assumption by developers at one, sta one, one stage not that long ago that that route out of hospital was de facto straight to a residential and nursing care business and that the councils locally would pick up the tab for, for that because there were fewer and relatively fewer um, uh, self-funding uh, uh, patients in that cohort. So there was a, a ready business that was already developing, if you like, and I think that's one of the reasons why we uh, moved to the, and changed the assumption that we would do the assessment from a hospital bed and, and strive to, to deliver on the shifting of the balance of care and supporting more people to continue to be at home and recognising that some people can uh, can actually recover. I, I think that the, there is something around about the availability of, of the workforce as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I say, in, in Glasgow and City and, and Greater Glasgow and Clyde more generally, uh, the, 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 there is something around about the wage levels, um, uh, which are different from the East. So uh, the cost of living is more expensive in the East and parts of the North East. In particular, where there are some issues, uh, and uh, and I think that is a reasons why uh, the government has attempted to address that agenda with the Scottish living wage uh, issue, for instance, and trying to ensure that uh, there is a more uh, appropriate level of, of remuneration for the workforce. Okay, I mean you've pointed out, I suppose there are some conditions that are particularly favourable then um, in delivering social care, um, but. When I think about sort of casework that I've been involved in myself, I had a, a you know a case where a, 
uh, uh, you know, a patient was kept in a in a hospital for several months just because adaptations couldn't be made to his home. You know, he'd lived in a tenement to which he couldn't return. So, so there was a long wait. Um, this was in Edinburgh to provide accommodation. So it sounds as if that kind of thing would be less of an issue. But I, I'd be grateful. I'd, I'd like to hear your, your views on that. But also, um, your campaign around power of attorney mm -hmm. um, seems to have had a big impact as well, because we're aware, certainly, that some cases where people are kept in the wrong place for a very long time have to do with that legal issue. So I'd be grateful if you could, you know, that's not infrastructure, that's about public education. If you could yeah. touch on that too. Yeah. Well, uh, certainly, in, in, and in terms of the, f the first point, uh, we're by no means perfect. We have those issues from time to time. Uh, and, uh, and, and very clearly that, uh, the, the, some particular issues we have a bit, uh, in Glasgow City, for instance, uh, particular housing stock, which can uh, create challenge for uh, many people, the tenemental uh, accommodation that, that makes up a significant uh, proportion of the housing stock in, in the city. And it's not easy, for instance, to put in place in a close, a communal close, a stair lift. So there are real issues there that does impact. And, and that's why we don't have a zero delayed discharge uh, figure from time to time and why we do also have uh, within the acute system uh, some fairly lengthy delays particularly in the under 65 uh, age group uh, where they're more likely to be a physical disability and therefore the need for adaptation uh, and uh, as, as a consequence of that. Um, in terms of the power of attorney campaign the uh, we, there is something that we uh, used some of the initially change fund money uh, that was available from the government four or five years ago to do a very local campaign jointly with the health board within the partnership uh, and and that has uh, been a well received uh, campaign and the issue there was quite deliberately to recognize that uh, the, the that there are certain pa numbers of patients who can uh, get delayed un unhelpfully for them in terms of their recovery journey for the lack of uh, a decision being able to be made for them mm -hmm. because they have no capacity themselves. Uh, and the power of attorney uh, is clearly a, a relatively quick and speedy process without necessarily then having to wait for the welfare guardianship uh, route to be taken because that is very lengthy and protracted. Uh, and, and it's seen as a preventative uh, and um, early intervention kind of approach that actually applies to all of us. It's not just older people, uh, and that's the message between uh, and behind the power of attorney campaign. Uh, I, I should say that it's something that um, chief officers across the country have recognised, uh, and uh, as a collective body, we have uh, agreed uh, in a, a matter of weeks ago to uh, progress a national power of attorney campaign on behalf of Health and Social Care Scotland, which is the, the <coughs> national collective of chief officers. So that, uh, and each partnership is going to be uh, contributing financially to the development of a national campaign, which should uh, positively impact uh, across Scotland. Glasgow uh, City Health and Social Care Partnership uh, is, is leading that process for uh, the other partnerships. And we are working at this point, point in time to, to develop the, 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 the procurement framework uh, uh, by, by which that, that power of attorney and national campaign can be uh, delivered. Okay, can I ask one quick question, um, convener? Thank you. Um, you're working, obviously, across six local authority areas. Um, when it comes to delayed discharge, is there a, you know, are there peaks and troughs? Are there areas that have greater challenges than others? It's it's a peaks and troughs business, uh, uh, essentially. Uh, there can be for a variety of reasons, and, and Jonathan's alluded to that in terms of the, the, the kind of de levels of demand that go up and down. And, and if demand goes up in terms of the front door of the hospital, then necessarily that at some point will flow through uh, to uh, the uh, the discharge process and the numbers of, of individuals in that. Geographically within those local Geographically, uh, part of the, the, the uh, response that Jane provided in relation to whole system working uh, is uh, we try to keep on top of that so uh, the nurse director uh, for the health board has a coordinating responsibility for uh, ensuring that we are we're all uh, keeping uh, abreast of and mindful of our responsibilities to just have that at the forefront of our uh, attention so we're as i say we we, we are in that granular uh, realm of knowing patients uh, and looking at things on a case-by-case -case basis 
uh, re regardless of which of the six partnerships that that covers all six partnerships and and and, and we're absolutely clear about the need for that okay. thank you thank, thank you very thank much you. The, the the Scottish government has set a, a general target for delayed discharge of zero uh, given that your performance is relatively strong but you still have 4,300 bed days lost in the current year is there any prospect of achieving that zero at any foreseeable point so we're working, as, as David has said, to, to minimise that. The number is coming down in the last few months. The occupied bed days has reduced further. Uh, we need to pay attention to, to the, all the things that he has described and also the mental health delays. And we're also working with other, because we, we have delayed discharge patients from other health boards as well, in terms of Lanarkshire and, and Dayrshire. And uh, the, we are working with all of them um, collectively in the same way as, as David has described for, for Glasgow and Clyde. Um, we will continue to make progress. We will give this the, the, the attention it needs because um, patients are, are, are need to be um, treated in the optimal situation for them. And so we will uh, do our absolute best to continue to reduce towards that zero figure. Thank you very much. There was mention made earlier of the 62-day cancer wait, and I think Emma Harper would like to yeah. open questioning on that. Emma. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. I'm interested in cancer waiting times. I know that... Um, Greater Glasgow is working with Lanarkshire, Ayrshire and Arne and Forth Valley as part of the regional cancer network. And I think there's discussions in place about other networks, like, such as Dumfries and Galloway, for instance. Um, currently, they're part of the East network, but Stranraer doesn't consider themselves east of south of Scotland. So I think that might maybe produce further challenges. But I'm interested to know, like, what are the reasons for contributing to the worst worsening performance for cancer waiting times. I know it's very important that when people are diagnosed, they get their treatment within 31 days, or if there's a suspicion, they get their um, further care within 61 days. So, I mean, what are the key factors that cause um, delays in cancer waiting times? I'll maybe just pick up the high level and then Jonathan again could maybe give you some of the details. So, so you're right, we do work within a regional context for most of this and there is ongoing debate at a regional level about what are the optimal pathways for patients, wh whether within the, the current West uh, configuration or as you see within Dumfries and Galloway and, and other areas as well. So there's no, the, we're doing very reasonably well on the 31 day target and we've more or less hit that generally all the time. Um, one or two areas we haven't, but generally we, we do well on that target. In terms of the 62 days, the, one of the key things is we have to be absolutely um, clear about the pathway for patients because you have to, to, to make sure that you're identifying those patients and tracking them properly at the beginning. You have to make sure that the, the, the time to first outpatient appointment is, is, is uh, optimal. You have to then make sure the test that if they need tests, then those are optimal. Um, and if they need surgery or whatever are going on to that. And, and if you don't do it in that tracked way, um, with, with consistent targets breaking up the pathway, then when you come to 61 days and you find that actually there's you know, surgery, you're got, you're, you've got a very small amount of time. So we're trying to chunk that back into making sure that if people are behind in their pathway, then we're, we're on to, to that, that um, pretty early in their pathway rather than waiting until there's a cumulative impact. There's not one reason for... In, in each specialty, there are different issues. And, and so um, there is not one thing. Um, so I, I'll let Jonathan give you maybe some of the details on some of the pathways, but we, we have reinforced that cancer tracking process to make sure that we've got that chunked into appropriate um, parts of the, the pathway to make sure that, as I say, we're not, we're not always chasing our tail to make sure those patients are, are, are in. But Jonathan, maybe give you some of the details on some of the pathways that are causing us some particular drama. Thanks, Ian. Yep, you're absolutely right. Some of the big volume cancer modalities are causing us the most... Uh, challenge um, in terms of lung, breast, colorectal and upper GI. Uh, a number of reasons for that. I think firstly there's a, a workforce issue in some of, uh, of those areas. Um, we've been uh, trying to recruit in particular um, to our uh, consultant radiologist cohort um, and we have for some time had a number of vacancies there which is uh, a real difficulty for us in terms of the diagnostic uh, part of the, of the cancer journey. Um, delighted to say that we have got nine new consultants starting over the summer. Uh, many of those who have been trainees been with us and are staying with us and have a achieved their first consultant role, which is good news. Um, and I think secondly, just to say that we have now just appointed and just started a new uh, breast radiologist in the Clyde area, which is one of our most challenged areas. 
So workforce is, is proving an issue and we're working hard to recruit and retain. I think, as Jane's alluded to, um, the getting the volume of patients into that first outpatient appointment slot within 14 days is a key target we're working on. Um, and also, at the other end of the spectrum, what's happened now is some of the, the cancer pathways have become very complicated with multiple stages. So, for example, in colorectal, um, we used to see patients going through two or three stages with diagnosis. Now, with much better diagnostic and imaging equipment and, and more detailed testing, such as PET-CT, we're seeing multiple stages, which sometimes make it harder to achieve that 62-day target. However, um, you'll be aware that there was a national consensus conference uh, around all the, the cancer centres at the beginning of May. Um, that was held and all of the pathways are now subject to a review and so we're taking all of the, the uh, all of the best practice from each of the boards in Scotland through each of the, the three um, regional cancer networks and looking at how we improve the cancer pathways to try and get back to the 95% the for the 62 day target. I noticed that in one of your papers um, urology was one of the challenges, is that because of vacancies in the urology? Area. Yes, we've had a number of challenges within urology, um, some of them vacancies, um, and we have been recruiting to the new uh, robotic service for prostatectomy in Glasgow, and we finally got our four consultants in place, which is a step forward. However, some of the subspecialty areas, such as reconstruction within urology, are very hard to recruit, and we're out um, scanning, trying to uh, persuade folks to come and work with us in Scotland, um, because it's a key area going forward in terms of achieving the targets. Just one other quick question. I know that our aged population with multiple comorbidities is obviously going to be a challenge, and also um, the increase in population as well. So being squeezed at one end in multi-disciplines, breast, lung, you know, urology as well, that means that obviously your pathway processes are going to be affected as well, just looking at population and, and age of population. So that's why we need to constantly review our capacity and make sure that the, the actual slots and the, te and the clinic templates, for instance, are, are, are reflecting the current demand. So we're looking at that all the time to make sure that we're, we're actively um, able to deal with that demand profile. It does change, and we have got to make sure that we've, we're fleet of foot in making sure that does happen. But, but the key to this is, is trying to keep down the waiting times for those patients who are in that urgent, as, as Jonathan said, in the, the, the urgent capacity at the front bit of the pathway in terms of outpatients, and then making sure diagnostic capacity is tailored to those patients and that we have a proper tracking mechanism. So, so we do need to flex the capacity, um, and we do that when we have to. Perhaps this might be an opportunity actually picking up on your point about the change in demand on the system. That yeah, might be an opportunity to ask uh, Jennifer Armstrong to just talk a little uh, about the way forward for cancer services uh, and the cancer pathway and the changes that we're looking to make uh, around that, bringing in perhaps some of the regional work. Jennifer? Uh, yes. Just on your question, there's actually a lot of detailed work goes into cancer planning. So we work very closely with ISD to look at all the tumour groups and we've been doing that as part of our Moving Forward Together programme. And you project right through, to, I mean, we do it fairly accurately. Uh, through to about 2025, 2030, so we know how many cancers we expect. And then what we did was we looked worldwide about the best practice, um, the new treatments coming on board, the new radiotherapy techniques, and we've got uh, eight tumour groups, and that has a cross-system approach, and that's what we've employed in all of that, from GPs to oncologists, and they will then look at well, what's happening with breast cancer treatments. We then do radiotherapy planning, and we do that on behalf of uh, the whole of Scotland, do that. So things like the number of linear accelerators, the big LINAC machines, is part of a capital planning project we do with Scottish Government. So what we then do is we say, OK, what, what is happening? So um, are we able to devolve, for example, chemotherapy delivery to more local units, depending on if it's going to be intravenous or, or oral? And we know that about 40% increase is going to be required between now in about 2023 and so therefore what we've got is we've got a regional plan looking at chemotherapy we're looking at developing the cancer units and we're looking at the cancer center as well as a whole system approach and at the other end what's interesting in the public health debate and this this became available about 2008-9 was there was a lot of things that we could do ourselves to lower our risk of cancer 
Now, we know obesity uh, is a driver for many cancers. So it's, it's actually doing it across the whole system about um, smoking rates going down and what we think that will happen. So what we've got at the moment as part of the Moving Forward Together pro programme is an actual projection of the increases, is looking at redesigning the way we deliver that, but also there will be a step change in capacity required as you begin to see numbers, numbers rise. So is there an opportunity for radiotherapy to be delivered more locally or will that be in core centres, like central belt centres? And also it's interesting to hear about telehealth might work for orthopaedic surgeons, but not necessarily obviously for chemotherapy because that has to be delivered face to face because you need intravenous management for that. Yeah. There's Sorry, I was going to say, in terms of the, uh, the, the radiotherapy, there was an interesting debate back in about, I used to work in Scottish Government, it was part of the Better Cancer Care, and we have a satellite centre in Lanarkshire um, with three linear accelerators there, as well as 12 at the Beetson. Now, the, the thing with radiotherapy is you have to be extremely precise about how you do it, and we've got some five different stages of checking, so check, you've got the, f the fields right, check the patient. It's, it's a very complex treatment to do, and there's a balance between um, as devolving it too much and the, the, the quality control has got to be absolute. We, we, we have about 700 treatments a day in the beats and, and every single one of them is carefully planned by a consultant, is carefully delivered and it's a very complex treatment. But with, with Lanarkshire we saw a big volume of cancer around that area so actually the Lanarkshire satellite is working well. It's delivered by staff who are trained and part of a bigger system at the beats and but it is delivering low, uh, um, uh, more local radiotherapy. So that's part of the debate we're having at the moment. Um, and if you watched the um, Beats and Programme, you'll have seen uh, a lot of the new machines we brought in that ha have, are delivering more targeted radiotherapy to prevent the side effects. And you saw that with the, with the prostate. So there's a lot of debate going on at the moment, and that's part of our Moving Forward Together programme, keeping the quality control, looking at the population growth, and then looking at your service model delivery. And that's what we're doing. Thanks very much. One of the other uh, requirements in the accountability review most recently was to keep the government informed of significant improvement in local health improvement activity. And I wonder if David Stewart would like to ask um, some questions in that uh, area. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Thanks very much for coming along today. Um, I'm very interested in public health. Um, and clearly, um, through Spice's good work, look very carefully at the, particularly the male life expectancy in Glasgow, which has obviously been well documented. Um, you're still obviously lagging behind the other major Scottish cities, albeit the rate of increase is very similar. So effectively, it's a, an historic lag. Is that your top public health uh, <coughs> objective? Perhaps I'll ask Jane Grant to, to run through some issues around that. Okay, thank you. So we do pay a, a huge amount of attention to health improvement and, and life expectancy and trying to, to, to close that gap. We have got a lot of programmes ongoing and, and David, maybe Jennifer could pick up on, on some of the detail then, but we are working hard with smoking cessation, obesity, um, trying to improve overall life of our patients because it's not just about the kind of health issues, it's a much more wider kind of uh, uh, issue than just health itself. Um, so we have got a lot of work going on both within the board and, and uh, also within partnerships, which is, is uh, coordinated through some of the board activities. But maybe, David, you could speak on some of that and then maybe Jennifer, if you've got something to say. Thank you. Certainly. Um, thanks, Jane. Um, the, I, I guess some of the, the particular uh, aspects that we're focusing on is, uh, are things like smoking cessation and, and alcohol brief uh, intervention, uh, not exclusively in that, because I think there is, uh, and this is the, 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 the function, if you like, or the, the role that health and social care partnerships uh, across the board area are having and, and are taking in, in collaboration with not just the health board, but also local councils in terms of activity and active participation in communities, so community planning partnership uh, uh, arrangements around about that. Uh, and there is also uh, uh, issues as well about uh, good physical health and good mental uh, health uh, in, in, in all of that. So in terms of the smoking cessation uh, programmes, for instance, a uh, quarter two figures for uh, this year or for 17-18 uh, uh, would suggest that we are uh, marginally uh, uh, below target in terms of the number of quits at 12 weeks, but we are uh, substantially uh, a, a good bit further on from the same period last year, uh, which we're uh, uh, encouraged by, and that's down to uh, uh, improved performance in pharmacy and community uh, services working together 
uh, in relation to uh, programmes of intervention. Uh, there are uh, uh, there's joint working with smoke-free pharmacy. Uh, we've uh, done some particularly good work in POSL uh, around about the uh, connectivity between pharmacy and community services, and we want to roll that out to other uh, poorer areas of or uh, yeah. areas within the city, the deprived areas in the city. Uh, but there's, uh, outside of that, we've got, for instance, in East Dunbartonshire, uh, an incentivisation scheme then in partnership between that uh, health and social care partnership uh, and the uh, Strathkelvin Credit Union, for instance, which is around about a financial reward for mm. uh, people in, in, in the 15% mm. more deprived areas. So there is, there's a range of uh, actions that are being taken in relation to uh, mm. addressing that particular issue. Mm. Could I raise particularly the uh, very interesting study for the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, and you're probably very well acquainted with this, but what I found fascinating was obviously they were comparing contrasting cities with the same uh, social economic difficulties, and clearly you can't be naive about this. There's clearly a major factor in, in your patch that causes this. But when they compared Liverpool and Manchester, they argued that the e excess mortality uh, couldn't be put down to any social index within Glasgow. I know there's some ongoing research on this. Have you contributed to that study, and what's your observation uh, uh, on that study? Because that's really quite interesting in terms of social deprivation. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll invite David and I both sit on the Glasgow Centre Population Health Board. I actually chair that particular board. Uh, uh, and I think yeah, you're making a very valid... I suspected valid you might. <laughs> <laughs> I think you made a very valid point uh, about uh, the issue in Glasgow being historical uh, and the work that the Centre for Population Health uh, did last year to bring together uh, its 15 years uh, worth of research over a long period mm. uh, into why Glasgow doesn't compare favourably with other cities that you would think that it would do. Uh, uh, as you know, I haven't read the report, I'm sure, that a lot of it is down to decisions that were made uh, a number of years ago around planning, around mm. the distribution of the population in the west of Scotland when the new, the new towns were setting up, mm. uh, and also then around uh, decisions that were made around investments uh, in Glasgow. Uh, and where the investment was, which differed perhaps from how Liverpool or Manchester, uh, as local authorities might have made their investments. So we are in a position where we're, I suppose, uh, paying the price uh, for earlier decisions. Mm. Uh, but I just want to reassure you uh, that uh, public health uh, is a top priority for this both. I mean, I touched on that mm. when we looked at the triple aims and made them quadruple aims, we actually moved public health, better health, to the top yeah. of the list. Uh, uh, as a board, uh, we are driving that. Uh, we have this year introduced a public health subcommittee of the board for the mm. first time. Uh, that uh, subcommittee allows the non-executives to help working with uh, the public health director and her team to set the direction. also helps us hold to account uh, the colleagues in the HSCPs that deliver a lot of the public health initiatives and the colleagues in the mm. board that do it. But we've also now, on the Public Health Committee, uh, uh, got membership from the Scottish Government. So we mm. are being quite influential, I, I think, uh, with setting the agenda for public mm. health across Scotland. Uh, we also have membership from the uh, Chief Executive of the Centre for Population Health is there. And as you know, the Centre for Population Health uh, pulls together Glasgow mm. City Council, Glasgow University uh, and the Health Board. So we've got academia, uh, we've got local authority and the Health Board all there together. But we've also started doing uh, a work with Glasgow Life uh, because obviously public health is more uh, than simply uh, smoking, alcohol, uh, drugs, mm. obesity. Yeah, uh, there is lifestyle and there's a support that Glasgow Health gives. Mm. We've been working closely now with Clyde Gateway. Uh, we're very interested in looking at what Clyde Gateway have done in the East End of Glasgow. Uh, post the Commonwealth Games and the reg regeneration there, mm. where the housing has improved. Uh, mm. The employment rate uh, has gone up, uh, but health hasn't caught up yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're trying to get ahead of the game and trying mm. to understand a bit around that. I'm conscious other members wish to get in, but just sort of finally, um, you've mentioned public um, health initiatives that have made a big difference. I mean, historically, uh, the smoke-free zones mm. were very important. Obviously, the smoking ban has made a huge difference. Uh, and uh, last year, did quite a lot of work around low emission zones, and we took some evidence from Glasgow and another committee. And I'm very conscious health inequality really hits Glasgow. It tends to be the, uh, the poor, disadvantaged, the ill and the elderly who are hit by NOx and particulate matter. Um, Glasgow is obviously going to be leading on the pilot. How important will that be to change your public health outcomes? 
and could you see your life expectancy graph go up um, to meet the Scottish average once we have the low emission zone running for a few years? Uh, we certainly uh, would expect the life expectancy graph uh, to go up uh, as each next generation comes along and is living in a healthier environment uh, because of smoke-free, because of emissions, uh, but also with the education uh, around better lifestyles. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, David, if you want to add anything from the perspective of the Senate uh, population uh, of the HSCP. Well, I think the, from the HSCP's perspective, and just to add to uh, the Chair's uh, comments around about our relationship with uh, the Centre for Population and Health Studies, we actually uh, had a, a, a development session for uh, the Glasgow City IJB just uh, towards the end of last month, uh, and the mm. entirety of that session was devoted uh, substantially to public health mm. uh, and as a commitment that the IJB wishes to make. Uh, to uh, it being the top priority or, uh, of, of the IJB going forward. Uh, so uh, m much of the, the learning uh, that the Centre for Population Health Studies have uh, has has been working on is, is now very much at the forefront of uh, the IJB members and, and we will be tasked as officers to come back with mm. uh, uh, you know, uh, ways of, of improving uh, the life expectancy uh, mm. issues uh, for uh, particularly uh, men. Uh, my, uh, I, I think the low emission zones agenda will be significant in, in that respect, but it will be one part of a, of, a, mm. of a jigsaw and a panoply of, of interventions to, to address that. It won't of itself uh, necessarily uh, get us to the, the, the Scottish average, but it will be an important part. Yep. To that. Okay, thank you. Panel, uh, if I could explore this a little bit further, I mean, preventable health agenda is something that I'm particularly interested in. And within the life expectancy averages, these are averages. And if we look behind that in Glasgow, there's a huge disparity uh, in quite, a, quite a, you know, a, a tight community. Uh, I think, if, correct me if I'm wrong, it's 16 or 17 years life expectancy within that. So I wondered what I've heard this morning is, is around how we're tackling people already in, uh, already have fallen into to ill health, whether it be through smoking, whether it be through obesity, whether it be through MSK or type 2 diabetes. Um, what work do you think are you doing? What work should you be doing around preventing people getting to that, that situation? Um, and also, if I could uh, throw another one into that, is I think we would recognise it's not just a health board in, uh, initiatives required here. So, uh, there's, there's you know, obviously education required in there and, and planning, etc. What work are you doing within that, that area there to, to try and prevent people following, following these patterns? I'm going to ask Jennifer to pick up the first part of that and then maybe David, if that's all right. Thank you. Yeah. I think um, I know that you've taken evidence before around ACEs, the adverse childhood events, and there's been quite a bit of work looking at how we might apply that within Glasgow and Clyde. Because I think with the adverse childhood events, we know that if you have four, four, a score of four out of ten and above, then your, your chances of uh, dying by violence, of suicide, of or just about everything goes up dramatically. So I think there's a real focus on actually trying to make sure that children have a better experience in Glasgow. Because these, these patterns are set through generations and, and you actually then see generations playing out. And there's a very, I think you alluded to the study uh, around the Manchester, I think there was a lot of excess mortality around violence and around drug addiction within that. It, it wasn't uniform across the patch. So trying to do a, a lot of work, and you'll have seen that with multi-agency work and trying to reduce violence, trying to reduce uh, gangs, there's been quite a lot of success in that. But I think there is a key around making sure that we um, uh, provide a, as good an environment to bring up children as, as possible. I think the next bit is really around looking at the key causes. So, so we have a, uh, how t the big challenge um, for society in the NHS is how do you um, keep people healthy and if you like co-produce, I don't like that word particularly, but how do you have that about trying to have people taking exercise and we've tried to do a lot of that um, uh, uh, promoting exercise, but also we'll be interested to see with the new alcohol legislation, because a lot of that with the minimum pricing will be a lot of what we're trying to do is shift the alcohol curve over to the left, so have everybody drinking at a lower level, but particularly in some of the deprived areas, some of the very strong alcoholic with high units, which were low cost, we're hoping that the alcohol legislation will help us actually reduce <coughs> there. So there's a whole range 
of different targeted at different age groups. And I think the other thing I would say is that a lot of the work we're doing with Moving Forward Together, because we've asked a lot of the, the community, they are saying to us very clearly, you need to give us um, the information that we can manage our own conditions. So once you get an early chronic condition, we need to provide a lot more information that people can actually manage the condition for themselves. And you'll see that coming to the fore more. Um, so I think it's really around, I think you've been doing a lot of work in the, the children's aspect to try and actually now, we might not see that for 20 years, but actually I think we've got to really focus on, on those particular areas. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just, uh, I suppose, a couple of things to, in terms of what we're doing so the, in the city particularly. So the Community Planning Partnership uh, is key to that, and the two priority themes for the partnership uh, in relation to the Local Outcome Improvement Plan are uh, uh, early years and transport. Uh, and a recognition that there is a connection between the two and, and, uh, and clearly the health board, uh, the health and social care partnership are, are uh, core members uh, and core partners in the community planning uh, partnership arrangements. The council has also uh, just recently published a commission into uh, uh, mental wellbeing. Uh, within the city, uh, which uh, looks at early intervention and prevention uh, agenda around about uh, the, the, the kinds of uh, areas of trying to prevent people uh, feeling unwell uh, uh, mentally and, and how that can spiral uh, uh, into, uh, into the other more concerning uh, aspects of behaviour and, 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 and presentation. Uh, and so there's a, a, a real connected whole system, whole system kind of approach in terms of looking at what we can do more preventatively uh, in relation to that which the, the, the city government is uh, committed to taking forward. Uh, and, and I think just to finish on, on what Jennifer has been uh, indicating in relation to uh, the uh, early years uh, agenda, uh, and this is something that, that uh, applies not just across the uh, city but across the, the, the whole Belt Board area, is the, 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 the centrality of uh, the getting it right for every child uh, agenda and, and the, the clear connections with uh, education. Uh, for children and how we make those connections. Uh, it's not, as, as you've rightly said, just a health board issue. If I could just, just a, a brief follow-on from that. And I think you, you alluded to that, Mr Brown, around the, 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 how planning plays into this. Uh, for example, you know, we know that in the sort of lower percentiles there's a higher, propen higher propensity for <coughs> fast food, a higher propensity for Alcohol, alcohol outlets. Uh, is, is there any work being done around that, sort of long term looking at planning and how that can change? I think that's where the connection in the Centre for Population and Health is very helpful because that brings together the Council, uh, the Health Board, and then the academic research uh, that provides that evidence. Uh, so it would be more an issue, I would say, for the Council uh, in making their decisions uh, around where they allow these outlets to. Flourish, shall we say? Yeah, yeah we've, input, we've, in, we've input into it, yeah. Last question in this area, Sandra White. I think most of the questions I was going to ask, you know, have been asked, but I'm glad that you recognise the fact that it has been many, many years in that respect. Um, planning people thrown out to housing schemes with absolutely nothing there and a sense of um, just loneliness and, and deprivation uh, is one of them. Uh, I'm pleased that you mentioned education. I wonder how much work you actually do in schools, because when you're going about, obviously I'm in Glasgow, I live in the city, represent the city, I want to be able to live longer, as does everybody else too, and a, a better quality of life for people. But when you go in the outlying areas, it seems to be a lack of aspiration, it seems to affect people and the positivity is not there. So is there any work that the health boards do in schools through education, primary and secondary schools in regards to you know, improving your health. It's not just, as you say, about health. It's much more holistic. And we had evidence of that from the, uh, a couple of weeks ago from the Cabinet Secretary that all portfolios in this uh, Parliament must work together to, to improve the health. So what input does the Health Board or that have in schools? Not necessarily yourselves going into schools, but the JCBs or anything like that. Do they have an input in schools that they speak to teachers and that type of thing? And my colleague, Education Director in Glasgow City Council, Maureen McKenna, would be very clear about the importance of uh, children's well-being uh, and the importance of uh, our health improvement 
colleagues uh, in, within the partnership uh, being engaged in, in supporting schools to, to, to make sure that their uh, program of activity and, and engagement with children is as healthy and actively active uh, based as, as it possibly can be. So yes, we do have uh, uh, connections and, and engagement with schools, not just within the city, but across uh, the, uh, the uh, partnerships uh, within the board area. Thank you. Uh, now we have time also to uh, address issues of finance and process and start with Ivan McKee. Uh, thanks, convener. And, uh, good morning. Um, it's good to see you again. Um, the, uh, and welcome to the, uh, the Health Committee. Um, there's a couple of areas I wanted to touch on. First of all, <clears throat> touching on the financial aspects and then moving on to some of the efficiencies and process improvements that sit behind um, how you're um, driving improvements there. So I, I suppose that let, let's start at the beginning. In terms of budget for this year, what is the health board's total budget and how does that compare with last year's budget? Uh, uh, thanks for that. I'm going to hand over to Mark, sure. uh, who will give you uh, the detail that underlies it. But you know, our budget, as I started off to say, it is 3.1 plus billion a, a year, uh, which is made up of quite a range of services, of provision for a range of services. It does get increased uh, year on year, and Mark will give you uh, a bit more detail around all of that. Yes, uh, thanks, Chair. The, the budget we have for, for 18-19 uh, is obviously we've received £31 million more income this year than we, than we did last year. Uh, the large part of that is a 1.5% uplift we get from the Scottish Government as a core part of that funding. Um, we also have, uh, as we've discussed, a, a number of service level agreements with neighbouring boards for services we provide which have an inflationary increase built into them, and that gets us an extra five or five or six million pounds. Um, and we have other um, smaller sources of income, uh, the National uh, uh, New Medicines Fund, etc., give, give us a couple of million pounds around that. So, so that, that sums up where we, where we get our additionality in here. Um, obviously, on the, on the counter side of that, we have a, a range of pressures that we, we have to manage, um, uh, and they are amounting this year to, to just around about uh, just under £100 million, a large part of that being uh, 40, 41, £42 million pounds payroll pressure. Um, that's uh, a large part of, of, of people moving through the scale, plus the, the additional uh, commitments in the budget to, to award the, the, the pay increase. Uh, and as always, we have other, other big areas of pressure around about prescribing. Um, it's the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest other uh, pressure we have outside of payroll, which, which for us in years in acute alone is around about 23, 24 million pounds, and that's increases in price and volume that we have to manage. Um, on top of that, we have other usual uh, sort of inflation increases you'd expect to see across our supplies and sundries, which which amount to around about 10 to 12 million. So, so against that that level of income, um, we have to balance that uh, that, that level of, of financial pressure and increases in all, all these areas that we see each year. Okay, so the 31 million is in cash terms. Yes. For, in addition to last year. Okay, enough, fine. Thanks. That kind of sets the scene. And, um, and and John Brown, you mentioned earlier on you'd achieve 60 million worth of savings, and you said the previous year. So I'm assuming that's 17-18, or is that 17-18? 17-18. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, and you exited that year with financial balance. Yeah. Then, right. Excellent. Okay. And then moving into uh, to this year, 18-19. What is the number? that you need to achieve in similar terms. I think you mentioned about £40 million for yep. this year. Yeah, right, OK. Slightly more than that. Just, yeah. just caveat, 17-18, we are still to go through the, the annual audit process, so, so we are, yeah, I mean, at the moment, internally saying right? we are financial <laughs> balance, we have to have that approved uh -huh. by audit's gone. So yeah, I'll, uh -huh. I'll caveat that. Uh -huh. I don't envisage any problems there, but okay. um, we have to go through that process. Um, so, this, so this year, we're looking at around about, probably, it, it, for the board in general, uh, and include IGBs and that, just about £92 million we're looking at. If, if, if it's just the board itself without IGBs, it's around about £85 million. That, That's the, the, the savings challenge we have in, in, in year. So, but clearly, you've got a track record of delivering that uh, yep. the, the, that scale of, of savings. Um, and clearly, it's a big organisation, very complex, a lot of different things going on, um, which makes it very challenging. But also means there's probably a lot of opportunity there as well if you dig away at it and find things. And you've clearly demonstrated the ability to do that. So, I suppose I just wanted to dig down to the next level and see what is the the kind of process improvement process you've got in place that allows you to identify opportunities for savings and deliver them. And I'm not sure if the, you're moving forward together program and encompasses all of that or if, or, or if that's got a different focus because clearly when you move into this area there are areas service redesign etc that will give you a big chunky savings potentially as they work through but there's also the accumulation of hundreds and thousands of small actions you're taking up and down the, the organization that will drive um, small savings that all add up um, so i suppose i'm, I'm kind of more interested in the latter of those 
what is the process whereby you identify those hundreds of and thousands of different small things right up and down wards that then all add up to a number? And what's the process whereby if I'm on the front line, if I'm a nurse or a doctor and I say, look, if we did this, it'd be cheaper than that. If we did this, it'd be more efficient than this. What's the process whereby that feeds in and gets considered by management and acted on? Can I just, before we move on sure. to that, just to be clear, the figure that Mark was, was quoting uh, is the financial challenge. Yeah. Uh, not all of that is met by efficiency savings. Some of that will be met by additional funding in year. Yeah. Uh, so as the year goes on, you get additional funding for uh, the winter, you get additional funding to target uh, the waiting times initiatives and so on. So that's not the... We're, we're that's not so that's the difference between the 80 odd million yeah, and the 40 odd that's, million. That's where I was quoting the efficiency yeah. savings that's that we're right. no, looking for. Yeah. Mark was quoting the financial challenge. It's important that we understand Absolutely. the difference. Yeah. <clears throat> Obviously, to meet that financial challenge, there are a number of things that we have to do. Uh, we have to look to what might come from national initiatives, what might come from regional initiatives. But then, as you rightly say, there's what can we do within the board itself. Uh, <clears throat> we have at one end of it a, a, a bottom up. Uh, staff suggestion scheme also it's called small change matters uh, which won't give us a lot in terms of cash uh, but it will help us encourage and empower culture and encourage to involve the staff but it will deliver you know a lot of small change does matter uh, then there's within the directorates uh, their normal efficiency plans that they look to and then there's the cross cutting uh, the end to end system. So that's the sort of different tiers and the different levels. And I think, Mark, would you like to talk us through some of those tiers? Yeah, the small change matters has been something we've tried to, to, to really launch and reinvigorate over the last uh, 18 months. It, it's because, as you say, the front line is, is where the money's spent, and that's where we, we've got to try to. To, to, to manage behaviours and, and manage financial control. So we've really we've really worked with our communications team to, to get a lot of uh, a lot of uh, information out to staff. Uh, and by launching an electronic form that, on an on, on internal staff net, we've given every member of staff that opportunity to bring forward their ideas, um, to which we, we, we then uh, we then review them and we consider them and we and we liaise with, it, with that individual staff member to, to take that opportunity, that idea, and, and turn it into a savings program with with their help. So so we, we're really we're really ramping that up and. And, and trying to, to, to get them as maximum from that as we can, both from individual members of staff and from staff forming groups themselves to, to bring forward ideas. So, so, so we do look uh, do look a lot for that, and, and, and staff are inherent in that in that process. Uh, the second level of, of saving, as the chairman alluded to, is, is we obviously have a devolved budget process across the board, um, and we give out a savings target to every director and every general manager that, that, that has their own budget line, and that can vary anything between one to two percent across the organisation, which is which is expected, and uh, and they will come up with a range of schemes within that 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 uh, that figure uh, and, and and they will subsequently deliver them um the one thing we've tried to do slightly differently this year it's always been within the board but we've tried to be uh, again to 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 change it a little bit is is to manage a lot more centrally for to get some organizational wide initiatives um focusing much more on efficiency and, and, and getting more for for the same working a lot around their processes um, and our internal ways of working to try to, to, to bring that, that change across the organisation. We obviously deliver our acute services from five or six sites. You get a lot of variability across working practices and across uh, performance, and it's trying to, to get the best out of each of those uh, and roll that out across the rest of the organisation. And again, that, that's something this year by establishing a central programme management office within the board headquarters that we're looking to support uh, and, and, uh, and bring new ideas to each member of staff to, to get more from that. Uh, and then, as you alluded to, the top layer, uh, the top level, is is around about transformational change, which is much more medium to longer term. Um, we're envisaging small progress or, or small savings in that this year, but mu much more focus on that in in, in, in the preceding years. Um, and that's that's pre predominated uh, uh, around uh, the regional working, which again we, we've touched on, but it is, is very much uh, 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 taking up a lot of our time and effort uh, in terms of moving towards that. Um, uh, and the Moving Forward Together programme, which is internal within Glasgow, which again is looking at, at service redesign and, and, and delivering in, in, in different ways, uh, with a big, a big focus on shifting the balance of care, obviously. So, so that's the, the different layers to, to which we're adopting this year. Um, slight change on, on before, but uh, again, um, building on the good progress and, and the good uh, delivery we've had in the past. That's clear. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. The um, projection that was published the other day for... December of last year suggested that Greater Glasgow and Clyde was facing an overspend for the year just finished of £20 million. Um, but you're telling us today that that has not transpired. Is that simply a matter of accounting or was there a substantial uh, change in the last 
quarter of the financial year. Um, it, was a, it was a combination of a number of things. I think um, when we, we, we set out the financial plan back in June last year, we had a, an £18.5 million pound projected gap, and, that, and that's what we've, we've been operating with throughout the year. Um, when, when that became evident, uh, we, we really took a, a number of different measures to try to bring that under control. Um, we, we put a lot of, of, of processes in place to around about financial controls, financial grip, as we called it, um, far greater scrutiny and monitoring around about a lot of our, our budgetary and non-discretion spend. Um, you know, examples of that were around about our, our premium rate agency nursing, which was a, a big cost for us. We've managed to, to half that in year through better management and through better interaction with our, our staff and better monitoring procedures. Um, we've also been, been very big on our, our, our uh, supplies and, and our sundry spend. Um, again, we've managed to take £5 million pounds out of that, much of that coming in the, in the latter quarter of the financial year by the time these, these processes and schemes were in place. Um, so there's a, a range of financial control and financial grip that, 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 uh, that, that happened in the latter part of the financial year. Um, winter is obviously a huge area of pressure for us. Again, we were projecting um, significant financial pressure around about winter, and, and some of that was uh, was prudent. Some of that was was around about the pressures we've experienced in the past. Um, but again, we put a lot of time and effort, a, a lot of detailed planning into winter this year, and we were able to deliver winter within the financial envelope that that would set out. And again, that that comes through in the last quarter. Um, and I think we're also, we're, we've, as I mentioned, we had a, a whole range of savings schemes identified at the start of the year. These take a lot of time, take a lot of effort from staff to, to, to be able to deliver them. And, and a, number, a number of them crystallised in the last quarter that, that again, helped to impact on that number. So, so we were predicting pretty much yeah, around about the 18, 20 million mark all through the year. And then just as we came out of the back of Christmas and the back of winter with a bit of clarity and a, and a, and a bit of rebasing of some of our assessments, we were able to bring that down to around about eight million at the end of, sort of January, February time, and then back down to, to financial balance at the end of the year. Thank you very much. Miles Briggs. Thank you. I wanted to pick up on that point because the most recent audit of the accounts of the board um, pointed towards you carrying forward an unachieved, unachieved saving of 29.6 million. So I wondered, in terms of um, future savings, where have you looked to identify them within the board? The, the 29.6 was a, is our a underlying recurring deficit coming into 17-18. Um, and that's an area that we're, we're continuing to try to, to, to increase and look at. Um, the, the, there's a range of different things we've covered in, in year. If I can give you an example of one of the, the big successes we've had in 17, 18 is around about the, our pharmacy savings. Um, and that's around about biosimilar drugs, where we, we uh, have a, a very uh, um, dedicated process of horizon scanning. We try to identify uh, expensive branded drugs that are coming off patent or, or, or that, are, uh, that are coming to the end of the, of the, the particular purchasing deals. Uh, and we put a real rigorous process in place to get all our clinicians and all our uh, pharmacists uh, prescribing those drugs rather than um, the, the more expensive ones. And again, in year uh, for 17, 18, that saved us upward of 12 million pounds within the acute division alone. That's a big area for us. Um, I touched on, on medical. I touched on nursing. Medical locums has been another big area of spend for us. Again, in 17, 18, we've really focused on, and we've managed to reduce our spend in that area by two million pounds, um, just by adopting a far more rigorous and far more uh, detailed process of, of delivering those services in a different way. So, that, so the big areas prescribing staff spend, the other areas we've really looked at in 17, 18 to, to, to try to drive out that level of savings that we need. And I wanted to go um, to a, a point which um, John Brown. Um, mentioned in his opening remarks around A&E visits, um, because I think you said half a million the, the board experiences out of a population of one and a half million. Um, and I think for all of us, we see actually A&E is often a good um, test of how people are using our health services. So I wondered what sort of work are you doing around that um, for people to actually go to the appropriate professionals? And, and what does that really say about general practice across um, the health board area, especially given the challenges you outlined um, with deep end GPs. Before I pass that on, it's a bit the point that was made about public health. Uh, uh, Glasgow and Clyde uh, has always been an outlier when it comes to the use uh, of the NHS. Uh, there's always been significantly higher use of the NHS in Glasgow, and it's across uh, all the population groups. It's not particular. Uh, to any one population group, uh, and in a &E, uh, we con consistently have, have been 11% above the norm anyway. Well, but as to what we're doing about it, I'll hand over to Jane. Okay, so I'll just give you the, the, the overarching board position. So we, we set up, a, a, as you're probably aware, we had a, a root and branch review of, of some of the emergency work um, that, that had caused us a challenge the, the year before last, probably. 
And in this year, uh, we've set up an unscheduled care steering group across the board, which includes um, a number of the chief officers from partnerships and a number of the directors from the acute sector, as well as corporate colleagues to make sure we're looking at all of the, the, the drivers of, of that activity. And one of the things we'd set up was, a, was one of the board's objectives you'll see is to, to reduce that demand and, and reprofile it in a different way. And what we're trying to do is make sure that um, we've got proper uh, anticipated care plans in place. We're clear with GPs about what the services are. We're trying to look at um, patient education in terms of making sure that they are aware of the range of, of, of other alternatives. We are also looking at are there initiatives at the front door so that when patients do ap appear um, at the front door that they're, that, uh, they, they're clearly, um, if there are other appropriate pathways rather than through that assessment unit or admission unit that, that we're looking at that. And we're also looking to promote our minor injuries units in those areas where um, we can uh, treat patients um, in, in other alternative areas where appropriate. So there's a range of things going on, but maybe David or, or um, Jonathan might want to pick up on some of the other things. There's a, a, lot, of, a lot of activity in that area. Mm. Thanks, Jane. Um, yep, yeah, we've seen a 1.7% increase in attendances uh, over the last year, ending in March uh, of this year. Um, I think the important thing, uh, as well as having the unscheduled care um, group at board level. We've now got three integrated unscheduled care groups based around the three main sites of Paisley, um, the Queen Elizabeth and the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Um, and David's team, um, through all of the IJBs, we now have these as joint integrated groups. So we're trying to get as much uh, of an integrated approach about what we can do when people come to our front door. Um, and we've got things like social work at the front door, We've got a good example, for example, in the Queen Elizabeth of a frailty unit where we've got 10 beds assigned whereby instead of going through a lengthy process, um, patients can go to the frailty unit and there's a dedicated team trying to turn them round and keep them as mobile and possibly at home or, or another location as possible. So a range of services there. We're also working with the Scottish Ambulance Service because they often are the, fir the first people, as you know, to, to get the call or to get to the scene. And we're working with them about appropriate places to go. So um, Jane mentioned our minor injuries unit. So instead of turning up to a, a busy uh, ED department, we're trying to get uh, our ambulance colleagues to work with us and with patients to suggest a minor injuries unit where be treated quickly, turn round and, and back out. Um, I think the other thing for us is is, is how do we how do we manage um, the the older frailer uh, patients coming to ED and again it's very important that we have that joint work with our um, social work and IGB colleagues to make sure the appropriate person's going to the appropriate place. Finally, just to say over the winter period we did run extensive media campaigns, local radio campaigns, adverts and leaflet drops just to try and to point people to the right place to go to get the most appropriate treatment. But we will continue to try and improve in that in that regard. David please stop learning from David and then Sandra White. From speaking to community pharmacists, and um, is that they feel they're a kind of underused resource, and I think their campaign about one, two, three before you see your GP was extremely, extremely good. It, is that something that you can link in? I'm mean, sure you are already doing this. Um, I mean, you know, and other boards have looked at this, and I was reading just this week about um, I think it was an English case where people who are persistent users of E&E, &E. I, I don't mean because of normal medical issues, but talking about hundreds of times going to, going to see E&E, &E, were targeted by the health boards in England, and they actually managed to reduce dramatically the figures there. Is that something you've, you've looked at? I think it was in The Economist this week. I don't know if that's something Dr Armstrong is able to speak on. Yeah, um, if I so with community pharmacists, there was a pharmacy um, strategy published a few years ago with Scottish Government prescribing for excellence. So we've done quite a bit of work with community pharmacists on my ailment service, things like that. But one of the big things that we're looking at now is what access we give them to clinical portal, which is the patient record. Now, you need the patient's uh, permission to do that, um, but it's also about the drugs that they're being prescribed. So I think that, that we will see community pharmacists develop uh, in much more meaningful and constructive ways in terms of accessing patient records, but also providing, they already do provide a lot of minor ailment service, but uh, in terms of being the first port of call, and we've done quite a bit of work with things like optometrists. So if, if a patient has an eye condition, we're changing it to they go to optometry as the first port of call as well. So a lot of that you'll see coming out over the few, next few months about working to the top of your licence and shifting work away from GPs 
making sure that people access the, the, the level which is appropriate to their needs rather than pitch up to, to an A&E. I think with the frequent attenders, there's some interesting work that we may do around the north of the city, which is looking at patients who come, and often these are patients with mental health problems who are in crisis, who, who will use this. And it's actually about what, 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 what um, services do we need to put around these patients to prevent them using A&E? And there's quite a bit of work going on between A&E and GPs to say, we know these list of, of patients, how can we put more preventative measures in to actually stop them attending? And certainly but that work will, will play out over the, over the coming months. But a lot of the issues, I think, with A&E are when we look at the Moving Forward Together programme, what we said to everybody is um, we had 32 clinical groups looking at it and we've engaged maybe about 600 clinicians and we had cross-system groups and we said, what do you currently do in hospitals that you can do in the community? What do you currently do in the community that you can do at home? And what do you currently do at home where we can do virtually? And what we're seeing is a big, is a, is a, is a program shift away from that. Now, we've got a, a thing called the, the stakeholders reference group, which has got all the charities, patients and everything on it. And we've been playing out all of the, the de um, developments with them over the few months. They all said very clearly to us is, if you make this big transformation in care, which we would like to do, and we'll describe that, we need you to educate us about where we've to go. Because actually, it can be quite confusing to patients. And because A&E has a big brand, you see A&E, that's the easiest place to go. Um, and, there, and there was an interesting article in the BMJ this weekend, and it talked about actually patients were, were a bit unsure you know, which pharmacists. So we need to set our stall out, I think, take patients with us, get their engagement, and then be very clear that this is the appropriate to your needs, not a &E. And at the moment, we have too many people turning up at a &E. um, We should really be preserving the four-hour target for acutely unwell patients who need to get seen quickly. Um, and that will be a big challenge for, for not just Glasgow and Clyde, but other boards as well. Yeah. Information from Emma Harper. Yeah, just you mentioned like the virtual aspects, and I think there's work happening all across Scotland where people are not being admitted to hospital because they're self-monitoring for COPD and stuff like that. So I don't think we've even scraped the bottom of the barrel for telehealth and the potential savings that can come out of that. So that's kind of the point I'm making. Yeah. Excellent. And finally, Sandra Hart. No, officer. Uh, I wanted to ask about the joint boards, but before I, I, I get to that particular point, it would be very remiss of me, considering the uh, minor injuries units have been raised, uh, which I was going to raise there, but I hopefully can raise it just now. And I'm sure that the amount of work that goes on, but you mentioned before, and it's been mentioned again, uh, about refiguring, you know, basically care and what's happening. Minor injury units, transparency, speaking to people. Uh, obviously, it's an open question. I've written letters as well. It certainly wasn't transparent to the people in my constituency that the York Hill Minor Injury Unit was closing. Uh, and I would just like to put that forward. Will it be in Gart Naval or will it be somewhere else? Uh, that's a question I want to ask specifically. But if I could perhaps go into the Integrated Joint Board, because I'm sure that you must have input into that. That was one of the issues I wanted to ask. Uh, basically, absolutely massive, isn't it? Uh, the work that you're, you've got to, to do, Mr. Mr. Williams. And you mentioned in there about, you know, moving together, engaging with the public as well in regards to the joint boards, six partnerships. Do you have an input into such as New York Hill Minor Injuries Unit? Uh, what input do the partnerships have? And do you think all the work that's going on in one size doesn't fit all? Um, the practical reality of dealing with the six separate IGBs just how difficult it is it, and can you progress in, in this style? So I'll, I don't know who wants to answer the question first. So Mr. Brown, I, I think there's three points there for me. And the first point is about the communication uh, of when we originally closed the mining Innish unit that was based uh, in York Hill. Uh, and I would like to apologise for poor communications around that. Uh, I don't think we got that right at all. And it's already apologise to you, Sandra, and your constituencies, uh, as you raised, first raised it with me. Uh, so that is something that, as a board, we're very conscious of, that we have made mistakes in the past, that those mistakes in the past have uh, damaged the public's confidence in us, uh, and it's something that we are looking at, uh, how we can actually be better. Uh, Jennifer mentioned uh, the engagement group that we've set up around our work to design 
at the new system and how we've involved patients, patient representatives, the charities, stakeholders groups. We've described that uh, and we want to do more of that. We want to get better at that. But you know, I just want to start you know, and make a point is that we are learning from our mistakes here. So the next part was uh, about uh, where do the people in, uh, in that part of Glasgow now go for the minor injuries? And I think, Jane, you would want to talk about that. And then, David, I'll, I'm sure, uh, give you an insight into just how widely uh, the health and social care partnerships and the IJBs that govern them are actually involved in the NTN system and the provision of the system. So, um, the, in the minor injuries unit at the moment, as you know, it was it was opened for the winter, and, and we extended that until the 20th of April um, to, to allow the Easter period to, to, to go by. Uh, in that time, there was approximately about, about 20 patients a day going through there, and at weekends, it, it was much less than that, perhaps um, less than 10. So there is a relatively small minor uh, m amount of patients going to the minor injuries unit, albeit recognising that access is important. Those patients at the moment are... are principally going to the Queen Elizabeth. And as part of the, the overall Moving Forward Together programme, we're looking at the whole profile of emergency care and our elective pathways and so on. So, so the minor injuries unit will be, minor injuries unit's patients will be part of that process. And as Jennifer has said, we are actually looking to see whether all of these patients need to come to a minor injuries unit, whether we can move them to a different place appropriately, or whether they do need to come there, and if so, how many and what, what are they coming for? So that detailed work is ongoing as part of the Moving Forward Together banner to ensure that we've got the right service services for the right people and that moving forward together gives us the opportunity to design services for, for the current population needs because quite a lot of the services have grown up in, in all of the health boards over a large number of years and therefore this is this is our opportunity to actually look at what patient what patients require and actually do something in quite a new way with new models rather than just doing more and more of the old so that's the opportunity we're taking with new, moving forward together and it will be a change for for some people and, and and as Jennifer and others have alluded to we will need to take the population with us and, and, and look at that so there's a lot of work going on but the minor injuries unit as a, the minor in minor injuries patients as part of that process will be reviewed so David say something about Please. partnerships <laughs> okay, thank you, Chair. Um, there's no doubt about it, the integration agenda is, and particularly when it's a multi-partnership uh, uh, kind of facility or area within Greater Glasgow and Clyde as it is with six partnerships, is complex. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and within that, there is a balance that's needing to be struck between uh, the, and for the board in terms of recognising uh, and, and, and respecting the, the, the responsibilities and, and duties of the integration joint board. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that balance is about ensuring that there is a consistency of, 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 of patient care uh, for patients across uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde and actually beyond Greater Glasgow and Clyde in, in, in large part because there are, as you've heard, many patients who come into Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, from out with uh, that board area. So there is, an, there is a need for collaboration. There is a need for joined up working. Uh, within Greater Glasgow and Clyde, uh, the chief officers meet formally on a, a monthly basis to ensure that we are working together. We are required in the legislation to cooperate with each other. Uh, in a multi-partnership board area, uh, and that's to ensure that the uh, responsibilities that, for instance, Dr Armstrong has in relation to uh, the clinical governance leadership isn't compromised because one IJB takes a decision about going down that route and uh, another IJB takes uh, a different decision. Um, uh, and, uh, and beyond that, I think we're beginning to get engaged as, as chief officers and health and social care partnerships within the West region, uh, regional planning board, so the 15 of us uh, do uh, have discussion around about that, how that's evolving. Uh, and as I said earlier on, there is also a, a National Health and Social Care uh, Scotland uh, network of chief officers uh, where there is an, an, a, a, a developing and evolving approach to learning, sharing, uh, and ensuring that there is a, a degree of consistency. And that's different from a uniform one size all kinds of approaches about recognising uh, the difference within communities. That's the importance of locality planning uh, within uh, uh, health and social care partnerships or IJB areas, rather. Uh, and uh, but the, 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 the I, I think in terms of uh, 
making it work. Uh, th there is uh, a need for a will to make it work uh, across all partners within uh, the integration arrangements. So that's the IJB, the council and the health board. Uh, and I think it requires hard work. Uh, there's no question about that. That's the nature of partnership working. Uh, and I think what you've heard through the course of this morning is that at the uh, uh, the in the key interfaces around about delayed discharges, around about uh, the unscheduled care agenda, around about moving forward together, the partnerships within Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, are absolutely up the middle of all of that work jointly and 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 together with. Uh, the, uh, the the health board itself uh, and our colleagues in the acute system. Uh, that doesn't mean to say it's straightforward uh, uh, because we're all learning about each other, but we're, we're committed to it. The will is there. Just a small... Very, very support. quickly, then, Sorry, Sandra, very it's quickly. Not that I won't, I'm asking to come along to some of the meetings, but I know that priorities in different areas, it also covers Vale of Lever and, and places like that as well. Lanarkshire, I just want to know how difficult it is to get consensus around what one priority is to another. Is it difficult with the six different ICGPs? Can I, sorry, can I, can I give you an example yeah, of uh, the the five-year mental health strategy that we have just collectively approved across the board areas and and the process and that that we've taken in terms of uh, delivering uh, that five-year. Uh, mental health strategy and it follows on from the government's own mental health strategy and is completely consistent with that uh, and it uh, and it is expected to deliver transformational change around about how mental health services are delivered the hard work bit is around about in, in, in involving and engaging in the first bit that that's a different concept to perhaps where we've been historically uh, in in terms of delivery of public services uh, and and, and around about ensuring that the, the different parties who are party to delivering on this five-year strategy, which is a board-wide strategy, uh, but must be delivered within the six partnerships because they're devolved responsibilities, is around about working together as part of those monthly meetings uh, and, and ensuring that people are party to the development of that strategy. Uh, and so that when it comes to the point of presentation for approval at in initially Glasgow City I IJB, because we host mental health responsibilities for the board area, but actually it's something that the other five uh, IJBs and the health board need to be party to, uh, it, that there is a consensus achieved. You've got to be confident that you'll, you'll have people signing up to that before you actually present it. Thank all the witnesses for their attendance today. Uh, it's been a very full session. Uh, we will now suspend for five minutes and then we will resume in private session. Thank you very much.